Good evening, everyone. Welcome to worship on this somber evening of Ash Wednesday. Welcome also to all of you who are joining us online for this solemn service. We begin our journey of Lent this evening. Let's begin our worship this evening by speaking together the words of Psalm 51 as printed in your service folder. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will turn back to you. Save me from blood guilt, O God, the God who saves me, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. In your good pleasure, make Zion prosper, build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then there will be righteous sacrifices, whole burnt offerings to delight you. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. Brothers and sisters in Christ, God created us to know joy and communion with him, to love all humanity, and to live in harmony with all creation. But sin separates us from God, our neighbors, and creation, and so we do not enjoy the life our creator intended for us. By our sin we grieve our Father, who does not desire us to come under his judgment, but to turn to him and live. Therefore, God in his mercy has sent our Lord Jesus Christ to take our place under the law, to suffer for us, and to die the death we deserve. God made Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. During the 40 days of Lent, we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. The time of Lent reminds us that to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, we must also know the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. As disciples of the Lord Jesus, we are called to struggle against everything that leads us away from love of God and neighbor. I invite you, therefore, to confess your sins, ask our Father for forgiveness, and commit yourselves to this struggle. Let us be silent, let us be still, let us pause now for a time of reflection and self-examination.
Please stand for the confession of sins. Most holy and merciful Father, we confess to you and to one another that we have sinned by our own fault, by our own grievous fault in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not forgiven others as we have been forgiven. We have been deaf to your call to serve as Christ served us. We have not been true to the mind of Christ. We have grieved the Holy Spirit. We confess to you, Lord, all our past unfaithfulness, the pride, hypocrisy, and impatience in our lives, our self-indulgent appetites and ways, our manipulation of other people, our anger when our selfish aims are denied, and our envy of those more fortunate than ourselves. our love of worldly goods and comforts, and our dishonesty in daily life and work, our negligence in worship and prayer, and our failure to show the faith that is in us. Forgive us, Lord, for the wrongs we have done, for our blindness to human need and suffering, and our indifference to injustice and cruelty. 
for all false judgments, for uncharitable thoughts toward others, and for our prejudice and contempt for those who differ from us. For what we think or say or do that is at variance with your will. Restore us, good Lord, and let your anger depart from us. Remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Accomplish in us, O God, the work of your salvation. By the cross and suffering of your Son, O Lord. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, does not desire the death of sinners, but rather that they turn from their wickedness and live. Therefore, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. During these days of Lent, let us implore God to give us renewal in his Holy Spirit. May we continue to abide in the true faith and at the last be received by him through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Please be seated. We hear the word of God for this Ash Wednesday. Lessons are printed in the service folder. The first lesson is the Old Testament lesson from Isaiah chapter 59. For our offenses are many in your sight, and our sins testify against us. Our offenses are ever with us, and we acknowledge our iniquities, rebellion and treachery against the Lord, turning our backs on our God, inciting revolt and oppression, uttering lies our hearts have conceived. So justice is driven back, and righteousness stands at a distance. Truth has stumbled in the streets, honesty cannot enter. Truth is nowhere to be found, and whoever shuns evil becomes a prey. The Lord looked and was displeased that there was no justice. He saw that there was no one, he was appalled that there was no one to intervene. So his own arm achieved salvation for him, and his own righteousness sustained him. He put on righteousness as his breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance and wrapped himself in zeal as in a cloak. According to what they have done, so will he repay wrath to his enemies and retribution to his foes. He will repay the islands their due. From the west, People will fear the name of the Lord, and from the rising of the sun, they will revere his glory. For he will come like a pent-up flood that the breath of the Lord drives along. 
The Redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Jacob who repent of their sins, declares the Lord. The second lesson is a lesson from one of the New Testament letters, 2 Corinthians. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. As God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favor I heard you and in the day of salvation I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. This is the word of the Lord. The Gospel lesson for Ash Wednesday, which is also the basis for the sermon, is in Luke chapter 18. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector, I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. This is the gospel of our Lord. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, the sermon is based on the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Dear people, dearly loved by Jesus, out of the mouths of sinners. That's our series for Lent this year. We give our attention to words that come out of the mouths of sinners as recorded in the Bible. As we look closely at these words that come out of the mouths of sinners, we see a reflection of ourselves. Sometimes it's going to be painful to look at our own reflection. But God takes even those painful reflections, speaks to them his words and his promises, and transforms them into peaceful reflections on our Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray that God richly blesses your Lent. Out of the mouths of sinners, to start off this Lent on this Ash Wednesday, we have in front of us the words out of the mouth of not just one sinner, but the words out of the mouths of two sinners. Two men. They're not real men, and yet they kind of are. They're characters in a story that Jesus tells, but the two men reflect the way that real human beings think, speak, and act. It's a parable. You are supposed to look right through the story and see over here a spiritual truth that Jesus wants us to understand. We're told right up front the reason for the parable. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Jesus does not have to hear people speak, nor does he have to see what people do to know what's going on on the inside. People's words and actions might reveal to other people what's going on on the inside, but Jesus knows regardless. He directs the parable specifically at people who, one, depend on themselves. They are confident that they themselves are just. They believe that they are righteous completely on their own. And two, people who despise other people and look down on other people. Hmm. 
depending on yourself that you're righteous, despising other people, how often those two things go hand in hand. To the parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. First, the Pharisee, a man who was very concerned about protecting God's commandments from contamination, a man who was very concerned about trying to keep the law of God himself. He stands up and prays to himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. So he prays about who he is not, or should we say, who he thinks he is not. Next, he prays about who he is, or should we say, who he thinks he is. A fine human being, off the charts, going way beyond what is even expected or required. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. As you would observe this man from the outside, he denies himself and he donates his money generously. The tax collector, that guy who handles and takes care of other people's money by force of law. But before Jesus has anything come out of the tax collector's mouth, he gives a pretty lengthy description of the man in his parable. The tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven. Both indicate a feeling of feeling totally worthless in the house of God, totally unworthy in the presence of God. He beat his breast. You know, you see pro athletes do that when they have a really big play and they did something really great, and I understand their emotional games. But the man beating his chest is exactly the opposite. Distress, sadness, feeling crushed. The man does not say anything about what he did or what he avoided doing. All he does is confess something about himself and express trust in God. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Here's the point of it all, Jesus explains. I tell you that this man, the tax collector, rather than the other, the Pharisee, went home justified before God. To those who want to play games of comparison, Jesus does some comparing of his own. This one, rather, and that one went home justified. And Jesus explains why. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So it begs the question this Ash Wednesday evening, I mean, you did come here into God's house, or online you are peering into God's house, and you're going to go home after this, or you're going to close your laptop and step away from the screen in one of two ways. Either justified in the eyes of Jesus or not justified in the eyes of Jesus. So which is it? Are you personally a Pharisee or are you a tax collector? We know what the right answer is, don't we? Well, I'm certainly not like that Pharisee. I'm not someone who's going to stand in God's presence and compare myself to other people. I mean, not even like that tax collector. What a jerk. And even while he's offering a prayer to God, and I'm surely not going to stand in God's presence and tell God everything I've done or everything I've avoided. I mean, that Pharisee guy could really use a dose of Humility, to say the least. Who does he think he is? So you think you're better than the Pharisee, do you? You think you are better than that man, that Pharisee. 
Yes, justification by comparison. I'm righteous because I'm more righteous than that guy. I'm just because I point out to people their injustices. Or how about this one? I'm justified when I'm more sorry for my sins than the sinner sitting next to me. Oh, you don't have to say any of these things. It doesn't matter. Jesus knows what you think in your mind. Thank God I'm not like that godless liberal. I have morals. Thank God I'm not like that heartless conservative. I care about people. Thank God I'm not like those homosexuals. I'm straight. Thank God I'm not like one of those bigoted homophobes. I accept people the way they are. Thank God I'm not a child molester or a rapist. I'm clean. Thank God I'm not one out there rioting, pillaging, and breaking stuff. I act civilly. Thank God I'm not like that parent. My kids behave. Thank God I'm not like that other kid in class. I actually listen and obey. Thank God I'm not like that church member. Or quite frankly, thank God I'm not like the majority of church members. I go to church. I give my offerings, and I give my time too. You know, while I'm at it, thank God I'm not like him or her. Thank God I'm not like anybody else. Thank you, God, that I am me. You know where that gets you, right? You're not going home justified. And if you're not going home justified, then you are going home condemned. You will get in your car and you will turn onto 260th Street and you will go home or you will power down your device and walk away from the service totally under God's damnation. Under the damning condemnation of God because that's all there is. I mean, you either go home justified or you go home not justified. There's nothing in between. So what is it? Jesus tells us this parable for a reason, and he tells it for our sake. Jesus wants to take any of those thoughts or attitudes we have that are like the attitude in the Pharisee, and he wants to do away with them. He wants to totally crush them. Those thoughts have to die. And as Jesus so often likes to do when he tells us his parables, he boxes us in. The only proper person to identify with in the parable is this guy. The tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Notice what is missing. There is no, I've done this, or I avoided doing that. Note what does come out of his mouth acknowledgement of his sinfulness, just of his condition. I'm a sinful person. And also, trust in the mercy of God. The placement of pronouns is really important that develop in the heart and that come out of the mouth. The Pharisee made himself the subject. God, I thank you that I, and then supply whatever it is that you think you are. Instead, the tax collector made himself the object the object of God's mercy. God, you have mercy on me. The tax collector's statement is a confession of sin. Yes, that's true. It is also a statement of faith. I trust that you are merciful, and I know that you will be merciful to me. A fine Christian man I know who went through a particularly challenging time in his life with sin came through on the other side and told me, you know, at some point, you have to stop trying to justify yourself and simply rely on God's mercy. And God is merciful. He really is. For his Old Testament people, God provided this mercy seat, the top cover that was on the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies 
in the temple. Once a year, God had blood spilled on that mercy seat to remind the people of their sins, but also to assure them, I have taken away your sins, they're forgiven. That picture for the Old Testament people became reality when God sent his son, Jesus Christ. The Bible says that God presented his son as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood, and that atonement is received by faith. This is love. Not that we love God, but that God loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Jesus is the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. He took away the sins of the Pharisee, the tax collector, and even the sins of people like us. He really did. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He has had mercy on us. He has given his only son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and he forgives all of our sins. So go home this evening, get in your car and go home, or turn off the device and go about your evening knowing that you are justified. Justified in the eyes of God through Jesus Christ, your Savior. We know that a person is justified by faith and not by works. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And he is. He has been merciful. Go home this evening knowing that you are justified. You have a Savior, Jesus Christ. And I pray that through this Lent, even more than through this Lent, I pray that always God gives every one of us this repentant and believing heart that simply says, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Amen. The peace of God that goes beyond all understanding will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We hear him 398. Part of our worship is also giving our offerings to the Lord as expressions of gratitude for his mercy. There are baskets in the back of church if you'd like to give this evening. You may also give online on the online giving site.
Please stand for the prayer of the church. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we have offended you. We try to hide our sin, but your eyes see. We try to laugh away our guilt, but you know that our guilt is eternally serious. Our sin stokes your righteous anger. Our rebellion causes your heart pain. Help us see our sin, feel the separation from you that it causes, and repent of it. Lift up our hearts to you with the forgiveness and peace that we so desperately need. Lord, you came to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. Dear Holy Spirit, you defeat the desire in us to sin through the power of word and sacrament. We thank you for our baptism, which tells us that you will never leave us, keep us from leaving you. Through the power of your word, cause us to strive against temptation and to rely on the blood of Christ to redeem us. Drown my sinful nature so that I live in righteousness and purity. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private prayers. We pray for your forgiveness toward us and for our forgiveness toward others in the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the Lamb of God. Amen. 